guest today, I'm sure, has hit a few lucky flops in his day. He started playing poker when he was just four years old. Five-card draw, crushing his brothers and sisters. He's never looked back either. Close to $3 million in live tournament earnings, 14 career victories, four WSOP final tables. Plus, he's closing in on $4 million playing online poker across all the popular sites. His website is stoutpoker.com, and his name is Matt Stout. Matt, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how's it going, Derek? Thanks for having me. 2009. You can't. By the way, it's early where you are, right? For you, anyway. I just managed to get myself out of bed. It's around 11 o'clock in the morning in Vegas right now. <laughs> yeah, that's early in Vegas. Listen, 2009, you came third at the WPT main event at the World Poker Finals for $265,000. Was that your first big score? And if so, how did it set you up in poker in terms of confidence, bankroll, and then game selection? The year before that, I uh, won the Poker Star Sunday 500 for 105 grand, and earlier, I think like a month before that final table, I uh, I won the Full Tilt 1K and took 13th in the Bellagio 15K. So I had some decent scores before that, but it was uh, definitely my first big breakout live win in one of the big majors. I, I think I'd won a circuit ring before that for around 50 grand, but definitely no six-figure scores live before that, so it was definitely a, a big breakout for me because I've been traveling around on the tour and playing most of the World Poker Tour events for about two years before that. Didn't have that much success, so it was pretty brutal up to that point, and that was uh, definitely a big turning point for me. It made me like live poker a lot more and feel a lot of justice for all the flights I'd taken and all the tournaments I'd bricked and some of the beats I'd taken on the tour before that. Before we talk about that breakout, let's talk about what you just mentioned there, the grind, because a lot of people, like your average player like me, a guy who's going to the World Series for the first time ever this year, let's say, uh, they don't know the schedule that you guys actually have. I mean, you're all over the world, you're playing long hours, and then when you're done playing, you fly somewhere else and you play again. Yeah, for sure. It's easy to do when you're winning and having a good year, but uh, when you're first doing it, I mean, you know you're a good online player, you've had a couple of small wins in these little three and five hundred dollar tournaments, but to some extent you, you're still trying to prove to yourself that you can do it at the highest stakes. That was a big deal for me, and it was definitely brutal for a while. I mean, I was kind of discussing this yesterday with Jason Vanstrom, a player that I've played with a lot. He's a good player, he's had some solid scores. He... Uh, he made a World Series final table this year. I think he finished 7th or 8th. You, you would think that I would know what he finished at that final table because I was the one who busted him. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't remember when we flipped and when I won that flip. But uh, he's and he kind of he kind of makes all these playful, half-joking comments to me about how good I run and how like I always get to go deep in these tournaments and it's so easy for me and I'm just so lucky. Like He knows that I play well. Like he has respect for my game, but at the same time, he still loves to make these comments about how good, uh, good I run, how lucky I am. But I told him yesterday, like, just because you didn't, you weren't there to see it, like, doesn't mean that I wasn't that guy who was like a complete unknown on the tour, who went to stop after stop and uh, just kept losing all in pre with aces or with other pair over pair situations, including one key one that happened in, I guess, '08, I think, when I forgot his name, Glenn something. I think it was an, an older recreational player who won the, WP, the WPT Falls View main event when it was still a 10K. And uh, I went up there and played a pot all in pre releases against Kings against Ryan Fizzler for 400K at 2 and 4,000 for the chip lead and lost, which doesn't really bother me that much now. But at the time, it was like I, I think I had, had two other spots where I was all in pre for six figures in a World Poker Tour event and just lost and lost and lost. Uh, just kept losing with aces, kept losing in some really, really gross spots and was getting demoralized, was starting to question whether or not it was really worth it for me to travel, get hotel rooms, and do all this work, put all this effort in, just to play one key hand at a venue. And if you lose that hand, no matter how good you get it in, it's time to book another flight, find another spot on the tour, and move right along to another city. It's, it's pretty crazy when you think about it. I'm wondering what that does to the psyche and how you have to overcome that, because I have a friend in Ireland, Don Fagan, who, with 75 people left in the main event one year, only uh, had one guy at the table who covered him, and of course he lost to him set over set, 
would have been a monster chip leader with 75 left. And that's got to be demoralizing. And yet you play for long hours and that kind of thing can happen. So in a sense, when you start running good, you've basically earned it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, most of the, I mean, there's always the occasional person who comes flying out, wins their first tournament on the tour. It's kind of, it's almost like Jeff Madsen syndrome, where it just seems like it's going to be too easy. And then from there, you you have to hit the grind. And I think it's psychologically, it might be a lot tougher to, to just come flying out with that first win and just think it's so easy and then get uh, exposed to the brutal truth. But, um, I definitely, uh, I paid my dues, I'd like to say. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that I definitely paid my dues before I started running pretty well on the turn. Kind of takes me back to the first question. You know, you have your first big uh, six-figure score, 265K. Does that change your, your game selection? Do you think it's too easy at that point and all of a sudden start playing higher than you should? I mean, I was 20, 23 years old playing every 10K on the tour. There wasn't really higher stakes. Yeah, you're already there. Yeah, it wasn't like I could hop into, like, the 100Ks that didn't exist. They didn't even have, like, 25K high rollers aside from, like, the Bellagio main event and possibly the PCA. So I was already playing the highest stakes in the world. It was just, and and I was playing almost every, because at that point there was a 10K a, a month in the U.S. pretty much, just alone. So I was able to not even have to leave the country to be able to play 10, 15, 10K events a year. I was flying around for all the 5K circuit events. I was pretty much playing everything I could within the U.S. Right, the bona fide real deal, buddy. All right, you've had some great success at the WSOP. In 2012, uh, you came third in event number 33 for 193K. That's real close to a bracelet. You followed that up the following year with a second in event number 21, a 3K six-handed final table that included the likes of uh, David the Dragon Fam. You lost heads up to Martin Finger. Can you talk about... Those two experiences, what it's like to go through the grind of a WSOP event, get real close, so close that you can almost taste it? Oh, yeah, that was uh, just like another example of paying my dues. At one point, I was the player who had the most caches at the World Series of Poker without making a final table until I finally made my first one four and a half years ago. I think I'd had 25-ish caches or something and still hadn't made it a final table, and I only found that out because a friend of mine who's a recreational player, Mike Hofeld, decided to point it out to me and did all the research so that he could needle me about it. <laughs> Within two weeks of fire getting that text message, I made my first World Series final table. <laughs> That's a tough go in a 15, uh, 1500. 1500. Yeah. And, and the only person who was an unknown was uh, a friend of Philip Grusom's who uh, Grusom was on the rail for and I'm sure was coaching. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it was pretty absurd. And I ended up going in with a ton of chips and lost a huge flip to Simon Charette, he's king against Queens, after going in with about $3 million and 15000 Went down to... 21 bigs and had 10s on the button against Athanasios's jacks in the cutoff. So even when I did finally make my first World Series final table, it was a pretty disappointing finish given how many chips I had going into the final table. Then the following year was when I took third in the 1K no limit, the Max Steinberg one. That one I was actually very happy with third place because I went into, I mean, for given how most of the day went, I went in with to day three with 27 big blinds, I think. I was definitely 10th of 14 when we got down to the final 10. I was 10th. I was 9 of 9, 8 of 8, 7 of 7 in chips, 6 of 6, 5 of 5, and then ended up with the chip lead three hands. It's real interesting because, as you just mentioned, uh, some third-place finishes are are good and you feel real happy about, and some third-place finishes are like so disappointing you don't even want to talk about it. Is it? It's interesting that way, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I like you uh, spoke about earlier. It's it, it can be very tricky, uh, tricky like psychologically to play tournament poker. So generally, I'm looking to play the best poker I can to use whatever information I have at the time as best I can. Not be results oriented in the aftermath once I see the cards. But the other factor is like how many chips you had going in, how many spots you had. If you can do it, like I felt like I played that tournament 
as well as I could, but especially, I was especially happy given how short I was for the whole final table, and the fact that I could have lost the flip early at the final table, lost the ninth, whatever, but I managed to just grind and grind and grind on the short stack. There was one time at that final table where I shoved six hands in a row and got through every time, which was pretty incredible stuff. Um, <laughs> That's pretty good. And I was like, Jesus, I really have a hand to pile again? Like, this is ridiculous. I got it three handed. I had half the chips in play, and then got ace king of spades in against eights. Lost. I flopped a royal draw and somehow freaked out, and ended up busting third. But then uh, I would say that the three k six max second place finish was a little more of a disappointing finish because I do think there was a mistake I made. Plus, I had a three and a half to one chip lead going heads up, and a seven to one chip lead one point during the heads up match. But there was one key mistake I made, I think, during the heads up match that may have cost me the bracelet. And the other thing is that I was annoyed at myself for not getting energy drinks or coffee or whatever, because I I ended up letting myself get a little too tired right at the end of the day. And that's when I made a big mistake that cost me. Uh, I, I actually think I made two mistakes. My bust out hand may have been a mistake as well. It's a close spot, but I think uh, Finger being younger than me and me not being as, like, prepared as I should have been and making sure that I was still awake enough for we resume the next day or whatever. I think that's uh, one of the reasons that I was a little more frustrated with my second place finish. Not that I'm not that I'm still frustrated. I'm not frustrated with a $313,000 payday. I was pretty happy about that. But there's always, there's always different factors that you look back and it's important to just kind of try to focus on your play and not be results oriented and not just be frustrated just because you didn't finish first in that tournament. Yeah, because a guy in your position, I assume, is going to be back in that position. And if you can look at it realistically and say, hey, I made this mistake and maybe this was a mistake, it's a learning experience for next time that you don't make those mistakes. Yeah, exactly. So I've been through several years of the learning experience. Sometimes I don't take away the lessons I should as quickly as I should, and I make the same mistake a few times. But I'm human. There's also an emotional aspect of the game and some tilt factor that I try to minimize. But there's a delicate balance for sure. It's interesting, too, because you come away from that event disappointed, but, you know, I assume 10 years down the road when you look back, I mean, that's a prestigious event. Six-handed, 3K, there's no dead money, every table is tough, and you got through the entire field. Yeah, for sure, there's that aspect of it. It definitely felt a little more satisfying to make that final table rather than the 1,500 no limit and the 1K no limit that I final tabled prior to that. And my final table this past year was a fifteen hundred dollar bit as well. So that's still the only uh, final table I made at the series that wasn't just one of the little vanilla Timby uh, soft <laughs> no limit tournaments, basically. Right. And you um, cashed in the Millionaire Maker, right, in two thousand thirteen. I mean, say I did, I probably did. <laughs> yeah, the the claw. Yeah, you were you. I think you were like five hundred and something, but you you, you cashed. And that was a huge event, you know, first of its kind. And the Colossus is coming this year, another first of its kind. What do you think the differences between the two events will be? And are you playing the Colossus this year? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I already made two attempts to show up at the Rio and buy in for all four flights after the World Series told me I could. First, they put out the statement saying that you could show up at the Rio and buy in. And I tried, and the cashier looked at me and said, what are you talking about? They got the supervisor who was like, oh, yeah, we don't have the program for that yet. And then Seth Polanski, two days later, sent a tweet out to me. Sorry, Matt, the issues are, oh, sorry, we missed you last time. The issues are fixed. You can go register now, Rio. I went over there. They were able to register me for the first flight and couldn't register me for the other three. So they really have that together at the Rio right now. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy into all four flights and hopefully not use all four tickets. I, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I love the huge field circus events. I know a lot of people complain about them, would rather play cash, whatever. I don't like cash. It's not my thing. Well, for a guy like you, especially though, Matt, uh, I mean, that's an event you have to play, right? Because for a guy like you, you have to play all four flights because of the dead money, correct? I mean, yeah, if I'm going to dedicate myself to trying to go deep in that tournament, I'm going to give myself every possibility. And the thing is, with re-entry events, I don't go that crazy. I might take a little bit more volatile spots and gamble a little bit more withdrawals and things like that, but I don't really go insane like a lot of pros do and try to get in for a ton of bullets. But that being said, if I bust, I'm definitely going to go in for multiple bullets, even though I, I do think that re-entries do need to be uh, looked at taken away in a lot of events because they've become a little too rampant on the tour in general and it's bad 
to the game overall, but that's another that's another topic for another time. But he wrote a really good op-ed about that, which is ironic because a lot of people look at him as like the father of reentries because he introduced the, the big multi-flight, like two hundred dollar buy-ins and stuff like that to commerce uh, a while back. But but now that it's become like almost every major event, quote unquote, is a reentry, like these thirty five hundred reentries, it's becoming a little bit of an issue. But in these events, I like how the World Series does it. In that most events are a freeze out. They have these few reentry events. That's how it should be. Now, uh, what's your approach heading into a World Series of Poker? How many events do you like to play? Do you space them out? Absolutely not, and I try to play every one I can. <laughs> really, eh? Just look at the schedule beforehand. You're a complete degenerate. I would say that. <laughs> assessment of the situation, especially at World Series time. I've gotten a lot better. Like Early in my career, I just played like 80, 90 hour weeks. was outrageous. Just did ridiculous things. And then finally found some balance in life. Started doing some things outside of poker, which is good as a human being. But uh, eventually I, I started kind of balancing a lot more, not playing as many hours. But World Series time is go time. I spend a couple, I try to spend a couple weeks, depending on what events are leading up to and things like that. I try to spend a couple weeks myself psychologically physically and everything for the world series taking some time off being ready for the grind and then i put together my schedule and play every single event that i'm not still in another event and my my schedule usually includes 40 events of which i play 30 to 35 wow that's incredible man Where, when do you sleep uh um, i don't <laughs> it's really it's about uh, all about massages, sleeping, eating, World Series. That's all I do. I don't go out and party during the World Series almost at all until I have like a big score. If it's like July 4th, I'll finally relax a little bit to, get to regroup before the main. What advice uh, would a seasoned pro like yourself give a guy like me going to the Rio for the first time ever? It doesn't even start when you get to the Rio. It starts two days before, the night before, getting your sleep schedule aligned with the World Series poker schedule so that you're waking up every day even before the World Series starts, at the time that you're going to want to wake up before your events. I personally, I usually get massages like every week to, uh, probably every two weeks, I'd say average throughout the year. But during the World Series of Poker, I either have a massage therapist live at my house or come to my house every morning if they live in Vegas and give me a massage for an hour before I go to the Rio every single day. And that also helps in that I'm on their schedule as well, so that I know that I can't sleep in, lay reg, whatever. I buy in the night before events so that I get better table draws and am not at the late reg tables and not having to wait for a late wave or just having 10 people in a row who just bought in cash. I mean, I'm, I'm making sure I get plenty of sleep, I have enough time to get a massage, get breakfast, get coffee, and be at the Rio on time. That's very interesting that when you buy in can ensure that maybe you get a lighter table draw. That's that's interesting. See, that's something I wouldn't know about. I probably shouldn't even mention it. <laughs> okay. When you late register for a tournament, often you're stuck with, I mean, most places will do a good job of keeping like the five seat, ten seat open at the, the currently running tables, but... I mean, if if it's the, if the venue doesn't organize it as well, or if they just get more players than they expected overall, they'll just have ten people in a row sit down at the next table. Which means, number one, you're getting people who bought in cash, don't care, didn't satellite in, and are showing up late. That tends to be the big name pros and people who are better players. Twitch is the new thing in poker. You see, Jason Somerville gets a deal with Poker Stars. Where do you see sponsorships going in the future? You know, they've been dead for a while, especially in the States because of Black Friday. What's the future of poker hold in that regard, do you think? I, I think there's a lot of potential, especially as long as Rawa goes down. There's the New Jersey online poker sites. There's the Nevada one. I mean, World Series Poker is probably not going to sign anybody, but eventually Real Gaming and South Point Poker might decide to sign pros. The Borgata and Party. Uh, Borgata's working on some things, and, the, and Party Poker already has a couple pros. The Seminole Hard Rock in Florida has a patch program of players who uh, are compensated for helping out with promoting their the events they have going on down there, the $10 million, $5 million guaranteed, $3 million guaranteed. They're running some pretty huge events, as you can tell, I'm one of those players. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I think there's definitely potential. We're back on the upswing, and I think that the, the regulated market will end up helping in terms of that like the the international 
national sites post UIGEA stopped signing U.S. players because they saw the writing on the wall. They knew what was coming to some extent. They didn't, they didn't expect Black Friday to go down the way it did, but they thought there was eventually a potential shutdown in the U.S. They stopped signing new players from the U.S. And I kind of came up and became popular at just the wrong time where it was just barely too late. <laughs> it, it was, it's been a long time coming for good U.S. players, but I do think that we're kind of on the, uh, on the horizon of some good things to come for the U.S. players who have put in their uh, put in their years of uh, in the game, have established a good reputation for themselves, have uh, kind of shown a community that they're good people, have uh, established a solid basis for getting signed. I think those people are eventually going to, or not even eventually, like pretty soon, they should be seeing some rewards. Uh, listen, Matt, I know you're you're on Twitter quite a bit. Um, you, you have a few posts I want to talk about. You already talked about it earlier in the interview, but you did say at Poker News, but regardless of what at WSOP says, don't show up at Rio Cage to Reg. I've tried twice. Second time, I finally got Reg for one flight. So you already spoke to that. Another tweet you sent out. Article claims that tanking leads to an edge, but it doesn't. People with edge suffer from less hands played. Can you explain that? Yeah, it's pretty simple. People like Jordan Christus take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight minutes per decision, even in mundane spots. Because right now, like if the levels are an hour and a half long in a World Poker Tour event, once we get down to the final six, they cut that to 60-minute levels. Once you get heads off, they cut that to 30-minute levels. And not only do we, like people tank more, understandably when you're at a World Poker Tour final table than when you're playing 50 and 100 in the first level of the tournament. So levels are artificially shortened by people tanking to begin with, and then that exacerbates it. So basically what happened was, Monka was tweeting about how they should stop doing that. Jordan Christos agreed, complained to Matt Savage and the World Poker Tour in general that they shouldn't be doing it. Matt Savage replied to... Jordan Christos's tweet about how they shouldn't shorten the levels by saying, you have taken the lead in the race for slowest player on the tour, multiple complaints across multiple venues, hashtag bad for the game. I said, do you realize how uh, that how slow you are affects the structure just as much, if not more than level times? Hashtag play faster, please. Jordan replied, poker is a game of patience and I'm fine with making my K's while they complain. Hashtag good for my game. Hashtag came for me. Hashtag tanking changed my life. <laughs> says complaints from the same bosses and or amateurs don't count if you respect the money uh, respect the game slash money on the line you respect my tank and the reason i shot back so so hard is i i don't really call myself a boss much but i'm almost positive that Chris, christos was referring to me because we had an incident at the borgata where i ended up calling the clock on him eight times in the same day wow he was just completely out of line tanking like the hijack was going to be on the button. We're all playing 70, 80 big blinds. He tanked for over two minutes. <laughs> I was just shocked. I called the clock, and Tab ended up uh, clocking it. Tab's the Borgata tournament director. He tells him to... Uh, he stuck around out, out for a while after because he knows I don't usually call the clock that often. And he's watching Jordan. And he could tell I was a little agitated with Jordan, so he kept watching. He, he eventually starts asking me away from the table, like, why is he doing that? Is it strategic? Is he trying to tilt people? Like, because he thought it was out of control. So he started giving him less and less time every time we called the clock. And I was calling the clock faster and faster. And they they eventually told him that they were just going to start giving him, like, 30 seconds or 15 seconds if he kept uh, taking so long. I mean, there may be a shot clock in poker soon. I mean, maybe it's needed. It really shouldn't be. That's another thing I was going to get to. Uh, my, my tweet reply, because of that incident, me assuming Jordan was re referring to me partially, said, no one respects your tanks, nor should they. They're excessive, annoying, and unfair to other players. Hashtag clock, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have enough space. There's only 140. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, when Matt Stout doesn't have his coffee in the morning, he doesn't want to be reading those kinds of tweets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> As a winning player, getting most hands in is higher EV than most gained by tanking, in my opinion. Which means that the the edge that Jordan thinks he's gaining by taking his time to quote unquote come to the right conclusion and figure out the optimal play 
if he would make a faster decision that might be 10% less optimal, in theory, like he's going to make the optimal decision 10% less of the time, only make it 90% of the time instead of a hypothetical 100%. Even in that scenario, which I don't think is necessarily true, I think sometimes you level yourself into making the wrong decision. There's like an old saying that I kind of like, you think long, you think wrong in poker. But even if that's not true and Jordan is going to make the optimal decision more frequently by tanking, it still doesn't make sense because that every two minutes he tanks takes approximately one hand away from the number of hands we play at the table. The less hands we play per hour, the less our edge is going to mean anything because we don't get to play as many hands right. as our edge. The higher the blinds are going to get, the more we're going to be forced to crap shoot and gamble, and the more it benefits the recreational players. Right. But even the recreational players are frustrated and annoyed by the slow pace of the game. They don't want to sit there and watch pro players take three, four minutes per decision. They want to play. Yeah, if, I'm, if I show up to the World Series of Poker for the first time and I end up at a table with Matt Stout, who's won millions playing poker, I might want to chat with the guy. <laughs> yeah, not only that, it might take four minutes per decision. You're like, really? I mean, we're playing day one of a World Series of Poker event. You've made we're going to four World Series final tables. Why is this taking so long? The problem with the shot clock. I don't think that someone who is a multi-tabling uh, star online who plays up to 20 tables at a time online is constantly making really fast decisions in that, in that scenario, has a WPT title, has played plenty of live poker. I don't think it's reasonable that that person should have the same 30 seconds or whatever the shot clock would be. I don't think it's reasonable that that person's going to have the same time amount of time to act as an amateur who makes his first World Poker Tour final table. Hmm. And okay. if, we, if we put a shot clock in, those that's going to be the thing. That's going to be the way of it, that those two people are going to have the same amount of time to act on their hand, regardless of the situation. And that's not fair to the recreational player. Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't, and I think that a lot of recreational players are going to be scared away from the game if they do install a shot clock. They're they're going to feel like there's that much more pressure on them that they're not going to be able to take their time to decide. And I mean, I don't I don't call the clock on a recreational player as fast as I call it on a pro because the pro it's not going to make as much of a difference for them. They already have a good idea of what they're going to do. They right. know the factors they're thinking through and. In most scenarios, it's not going to make as much of a difference to them personally, whether they make a slightly wrong decision in that scenario or whatever. But if we're deep in the tournament, and I can tell it's like a, a recreational player's first time in the money in a World Poker Tour event or whatever the situation is, depending on the situation, I can give them longer. So I think the answer is that players really need to police themselves more. We need to get rid of this taboo that calling the clock is bad etiquette. What's bad etiquette is taking away a lot of time from your from the rest of your table, making your table play less hands per hour than another table. You've taken away from the good players' edges at your table and are making it bad for everyone. So I think it's way worse etiquette to take three, four minutes in a mundane spot that's not a huge critical point in your tournament. I think it's worse etiquette to waste everyone's time and do that to the detriment of your table and selfishly than it is to call a clock on that player. Really interesting point of view there, Matt. Appreciate it. Lastly, real quick on this one, a, a tweet from you. If you're the type to bluff the river, get called, muck your hand, <laughs> then insist on seeing the winning hand, please go ahead and die. We don't need you, hashtag. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty annoyed that day. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing, I wasn't even involved in that hand. <laughs> It annoys me. <laughs> what happened was a young regular player, a guy who plays a lot of tournaments in the bike, he's in a pot against a 70 ish year old recreational player. The reg bets the river as a bluff, gets called, and then monks his hand, makes sure it's all the way down in the monk and unretrievable, and then says, I want to see the winning hand. What does he add? Like, oh my god. Wow. This is annoying on multiple levels. <laughs> um, now, the first level is that the guy is hiding the, his information and trying to get information out of another player at the table. It's pretty ridiculous that they would allow that guy to ask to see the recreational player's hand, ask to see the winning hand in this situation. Especially when he got called. The, yeah, the rule. 
rule is the rule there is the only reason that we would force the winning hand to be shown is to prevent collusion and make sure there's nothing fishy going on. That's a dumb rule to begin with. People can collude and just not get it all in and just, you know, bet full three quarters of your stack, whatever. I don't feel like giving them a rundown on the best ways right. to eat. But um it's it's very over it's very easy to overcome that rule as a colluder. So it doesn't really do much to prevent collusion. The other thing is the poker TDA Tournament Directors Association has already changed the rules so that the winning hand does not need to be shown. I know in Savages tournaments it doesn't need to be shown. I think the TDA has also changed this rule. So now it's just a World Series of Poker rule that differs from the TDA rule that says that the winning hand still needs to be shown, which is the only reason that this guy can get away with forcing the winning hand to be shown after he bluffed and didn't even show his hand. For a while, the TDA rule was that anyone else at the table besides the guy who bluffed could ask to see the hand, which makes sense in a collusion sense, in that the person who bluffed the river and bluffed is never going to be checking, seeing the other guy's hand to prevent collusion, because if he's being if he's colluding, right. that's the guy he'd be colluding with. Right. So it would make no sense for that guy to try to prevent collusion by asking to see his hand. So it even the old TDA rule would have prevented that guy from being able to ask to see the hand. I, as a bystander, would have been able to see the hand, but I think they changed the rule so that only people who still have cards can see it. I don't know. It's just ridiculous. I, I don't really have too much of an interest in the subtle differences between those rules, but the bottom line is that the last person that should ever be able to ask to see that hand is the guy who bluffed and then hid his hand in the box. Yeah, so, it's bad etiquette, man. Yeah, it's really bad etiquette. And then the, the thing that annoyed me more is that the floor came over, sided with the other player, because I then I asked that because his hand was in the box, but I could tell which two they were. So just to annoy him, I called the floor over and wanted to see his hand since he was, the, was supposed to be the first one to show, just to piss him off a little. <laughs> the floor comes over, tells me that they they won't show it because uh, unless I suspect it. They're like, well, do you suspect collusion? Like, and the floor just kind of was ridiculous about it. He 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 asked if I uh, suspected collusion, but in reality, that was the only reason that they would force the winning hand to be shown anyway. Right. The guy just didn't really understand the the rule and the basis for the rule and just kind of started throwing out random answers to me. I just took to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, folks. Uh, if you piss off Matt Stout, he's going to take to Twitter. Listen, Matt, I uh, really appreciate your time today. Sorry it went a bit long, but uh, thank you so much, and good luck at the World Series of Poker. I know you're playing the Colossus. I'll be there the same weekend. Hopefully we can meet each other in person. Sounds good, Derek. Give me a text.